Welcome everyone to today's session of Hot Topics in Nutrition led by Meg Wilkes. Meg will be discussing protein needs in this session of our series. This program is hosted by the Blum Resource Center. Over at the Blum, we are grateful to the nutrition team for this continued partnership. The recording of this session will be posted on our Blum YouTube playlist and our Blum Digital Resource Center. For those of you watching live, if you have any questions related to today's program, please feel free to utilize the chat feature throughout the session. At the end of the session, your questions that in the chat will be used to moderate a Q&A. If you have any other questions or would like more information about resources and programs offered through the Blum, please visit our website at www.dana-farber.org slash resource center, or you can email us at blum underscore center at dfci.harbor.edu. Thank you all for joining us. I will now pass the workshop over to Meg. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, my name is Meg Wilkes. I'm one of the dietitians that work at Dana-Farber. I work at the Foxborough site currently. Um, today, I'm going to be focusing on protein needs, but eating a nutritious diet is important before, during, and after your treatment. And a healthy diet includes eating a variety of foods in your diet, such as fats, carbohydrates, proteins, fruits, vegetables, fiber, and grain. But today I'm going to mostly focus on the protein part as when I see a lot of patients in treatment, they're very frequently asking me about protein, how to get protein, and how much protein they need. The first thing is why do our bodies need protein? What does protein do for us? Well, first of all, every cell in our body needs protein to function. Protein helps repair our cells. It maintains our muscle math, mass and growth. It helps oxygenate our red blood cells. It regulates our hormones. It also aids in the digestive process and it helps give us energy. How much protein do we need? Well, that's a good question and it is variable, but I'm just gonna go over some general information today. The average person needs about 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. So we tend to use weight in this country as opposed to kilograms. So to convert to kilograms, you would take your weight and divide it by 2.2. So in this example, we have a person that weighs 160 pounds and they should have about 73 grams of protein a day. Now, when we recommend protein like 73 grams, it doesn't mean you have to be a calculator getting exactly to 73, but it's just a range that you can look at to make sure you're getting in the amount of protein that you will need for your body. Um, your medical condition, if you have surgery, the different treatments all play a role in how much protein your body needs. Most people who are going through cancer therapy or have had surgery are going to need a, a higher level of protein in their diet. So if you meet with a dietitian or nutritionist while you're having your treatment, they will sit down with you and they will calculate out how much protein you need daily based on your weight history, what your diagnosis is, and what your treatment plan is going to be. Protein is made up of what we call building blocks, which are amino acids. And our body is made up of about 20 amino acids that it needs to function. We have um, broken down into two groups, essential or complete, or non-essential, and I'll be going over the non-essential afterwards. So an essential or complete amino acid is the amino acids that our body cannot make. So we have to get these amino acids through the foods we eat. And the foods that supply all these amino acids, they call complete amino acids, include your poultry, your turkey, fish, pork, eggs, beef, most of your animal products are where you get your complete proteins. But you also can find complete protein in soy foods like tofu, edamame. Your incomplete proteins are proteins that are limited in one or more of the essential amino acids. And these are the type of proteins that a lot of times you find in your plant sources. So um, these foods are good sources of protein, but they're called incomplete proteins because they don't have all the amino acids. And this would be your beans, like your garbanzo beans, your chickpeas, your lentils, 
whole grains, quinoa, and the nuts and seeds are all very good sources of plant protein. And the one thing I always talk about when I'm talking about plant protein is when you get the plant protein, um, you also are getting different fiber, you're getting vitamins and minerals. Now, a lot of people will say to me, oh, if you're a vegetarian or vegan, you can't get all the amino acids you need. And that is not true. Just as long as you eat a variety of plant foods, your body will get all the amino acids that you do need. <clears throat> a lot of people will say, well, I know how much protein I need, but where am I going to get it and how much protein am I going to have? So... Um, I went over in the last few slides where you get protein, but now I'm going to go over how much protein you get in average foods. So in your poultry or chicken, about three ounces have about 24 to 27 grams of protein. And so three ounces, we explain, is kind of like a deck of cards. So if you have like a small chicken breast, you're probably getting about the 27 grams of protein. You also find protein in your fish and your shellfish. Um, Things like tuna, salmon, haddock, um, shrimp, scallops, they all will provide your body with protein. And they average about 18 to 21 grams of protein based on a three ounce portion. Um, just thinking about tuna, I had one of my patients tell me the other day, he ate a whole can of tuna. He's like, I read the label and it had 29 grams of protein in it. I couldn't believe it. So um you can get quite a bit amount of protein from your fish products also. Your beef products also provide protein. They, in a three ounce serving, it ranges from about 20 to, 21 to 24 grams of protein for a three ounce portion. I'll be talking a little bit more about beef um, in the rest of our talk, but we often have people limit their beef because it is high in saturated fat, which is something that is not the best for our body. So when we do have beef, we recommend the lean cuts of beef, um, like your um, sirloin, your tenderloin type of products. And the same way with pork. Pork, three ounces of pork has about 18 grams of protein in it. Um, you also get a good amount of protein from your eggs. Most eggs have about six to eight grams of protein in it. Most of the protein is found in the whites. So if you have two egg whites, you can get like six grams of protein. And a lot of people will use egg substitutes. And most of them in a third of a cup have about eight grams of protein. Your dairy products are another way to get a great amount of protein in your diet. So a cup of milk has about eight grams of protein. And a lot of people say, well, does that make a difference if I use skim milk, whole milk, low fat? It doesn't really make a difference. It's still gonna give you about the same amount of protein. Your cheese is also a good source of protein. An ounce of cheese has about seven grams of protein. And you also can get quite a bit of protein from the cottage cheese, ricotta, um, your grated Parmesan cheese, a half a cup of that has about 16 grams of protein. Yogurt is another good source of protein. Um, most yogurts have about um, six to eight grams of protein in them, but the Greek yogurts tend to have a much higher level of protein in them. So usually when we're working with patients, we try to encourage them to get the Greek protein because they can get more protein in the same volume of food. Um, also, there's some products out there that put in higher amounts of protein in them. And there's a product called uh, Oikos Pro. And that product has about 20 grams of protein in a container of yogurt. And Chobani also makes a protein drink, which is called Chobani Complete Drink. And in that drink, there's about um, 20 grams of protein in it. Now I'm gonna talk over, switch over to our plant-based foods and how you can get protein from those type of foods. So your soy products have a good amount of protein in them. A uh, cup of soy milk has about eight grams of protein. So it's a similar amount of protein as your milk. And as you remember, your soy products do contain all the essential amino acids. Um, you can get protein from uh, soy nuts, have about 10 grams of protein, half a cup, of soybeans have about 11 grams of protein. Uh, your soft uh, silken tofu has about three grams of protein. Uh, 
your firm to tofu has about six grams of protein. I think I said that wrong. And yeah, three ounces of tempeh, which is your cooked or fermented soybeans, they have about 15 grams of protein. So that's quite a bit. And a lot of people will use the soy yogurt and that has about six grams of protein in it. You also can get a lot of protein from your beans, things like your kidney beans, your black beans, your garbanzo beans, your lentils, your lima beans. A half a cup has about nine grams of protein in it. And hummus is usually a very good source of protein too. And that quarter of a cup has about six grams of protein. Your nuts and seeds can also add protein to your diet. So um, if you have a quarter of a cup of your almonds, peanuts, pistachio, your pumpkin or your sunflower seeds have about seven grams of protein. So we're in a good season right now for pumpkin seeds. So um, that's always a way that you can add, add extra protein to your diet. A quarter cup of your cashew, brazil nuts, um, pine nuts, walti, walnuts have about five grams of protein in it. Your macadamia nuts and your pecans have a little bit less protein. A quarter of a cup is about three grams of protein. Also, you can get from your peanut butter a good amount of protein. Two tablespoons is going to provide you with about eight grams of protein. Also, people are going into different types of nut butters, and you can look at them individually to see how much protein. But for example, two tablespoons of almond butter have about six to eight grams of protein. You can also get a good amount of protein from your different grains. Quinoa is a grain where a cup of quinoa has about eight grams of protein. You see a lot more quinoa than you did in the past. Um, it's becoming more popular, and it's a good way to get protein. Um, you have a lot of the pastas. Barilla makes a protein plus pasta, and you would get about 10 grams of protein in a serving of a cup of pasta. Your steel cut oats, uh, they have a has about five grams of protein in it. And in a quarter of a cup, in a quarter of a cup of your grains like farro and um has about seven grams of protein. Um, barley, you can get protein from, and that has about five grams of protein in it. Other ways to get protein in your diet. So a lot of patients I work with, their appetite isn't very good. It's difficult for them to get protein in their diet. So sometimes they go to other means to get protein and through protein powders, and we're talking about protein drinks. So Protein powders vary in the amount of protein there is in a serving. So when you look at a can of protein and you're deciding to get it, you want to look at the protein and see how much is in a serving. You always want to look at the serving size. And it's important to read the label on the protein powder because you want to pick a protein powder that's going to provide you good nutrition that's healthy. You want to avoid products that have unnecessary ingredients, them, like if they have corn syrup listed, or fructose syrup, or artificial flavorings, or they're very high in sugar. It may not be the best protein product. Um, your protein products, you usually find casein and whey as a source of protein, and casein and whey uh, protein that comes from cow's milk. So that would have all the essential amino acids. You also can get protein powder that they're based on soy protein. Soy protein contains all the amino acids. And pea protein is very popular in a lot of the vegan um, protein powders. And it contains eight out of the nine essential amino acids. But I would never tell someone not to get a, a pea protein because it's limited in one amino acid. Because by eating a variety of food during the day, you're going to get that other amino acid that your body needs. Protein bars are another convenient way for people to get protein, especially if they're going to be, let's say, going on a long car journey and they want to make sure they get in their protein every couple of hours. They can carry a protein bar with them. Um, some people that work, it's easy for them to bring a pro protein bar in. But it was, you look down the aisles of protein bars, um, every day there's a new protein bar and there's a lot of different choices. So what I recommend to people is, first of all, your label is going to be your friend. It's going to tell you exactly what's in the food product. So you want to look at it and see what you're going to be eating with that protein bar and if it's your best choice. 
You want to be careful of protein bars that have sugar, sucrose, or high fructose corn syrup as the main ingredient. When you have an ingredient list, the ingredients are listed to the ingredients that are most in the product, product and then descending. So if your first ingredient in the product is sugar, you're going to know that that's probably not the best choice for you. You want to also avoid bars um, that have sugar alcohols in it. A lot of the bars will limit their calories because they'll put sugar alcohol in it. But sugar alcohols, and these are things like xylitol, sorbitol, and maltol, you want to look for them on the label because they can cause a lot of bloating and gas and have a laxative effect. A lot of people that are going through treatment, their treatment does cause side effects that they may get problems with gas, they may get problems with diarrhea, and eating a bar like this would not be their best choice. I also like to comment that most cereal bars are not a good choice of um, protein. A lot of times my patients will come into the clinic and they're like, well, I'm eating the cereal bar. And most cereal bars, if you look at them, have only about maybe two to five grams of protein in them, which isn't much, but they usually contain a lot of added sugar. So look at the protein, look at the amount of sugar that's in the bar. Protein drinks are very popular. A lot of times when people are going through treatment, they can have difficulty eating solid foods, a lot of to meet their needs, and they find by taking a protein drink, it helps them because they most of them have a lot of nutrition in a small volume, let's say eight to 10 ounces. So it's easy for them to drink that drink and try to get their protein needs met. So um, protein drinks, you can find such a variety. You can find protein drinks that are organic. You can find plant-based protein drinks. Um, you can find drinks like I have listed here, Owen, which stands for only what you need. And that's a protein drink that does not contain any of the eight major allergens. So if someone's allergic to milk, they're allergic to soy, uh, these would be a product that we could recommend to them. Um, because they don't have those allergens in them. Um, also, there's drinks that for people that have diabetes, sometimes they want to make sure that they're not having problems with their blood sugar. And there's drinks out there that like this one I have listed is Glucerna, which is um, glucose control to help people with diabetes. Boost also makes a drink. But when you meet with your nutritionist, they can go over the different drinks and uh, pick out... Or, tell you a drink that has the profile, the calories, and the protein that you need that's best for your situation. I also really encourage people to look at the calories because a lot of protein drinks out there are really aimed at people that are working out in the gym, they want to build muscles, and they think by drinking these drinks with a lot of protein in them that that's going to help them. So a lot of drinks out there that People see they may have very high amounts of protein, like 30, 35, 40 grams of protein in them. But then you look at the calories and they only have like 150 calories. Most people going through treatment need both the calories and the protein. Um, if you're not eating enough food and you need a protein drink, you want to try to get one that's going to give your body calories too. So you just want to be cautious of that if you pick a protein drink that has 30 grams of protein, 150 calories, you may need to do something to that particular protein drink to give it more calories, like adding fruit or adding ice cream. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the food label now, because I've been mentioning that when we're going through some of how to pick up protein products. So most foods will have a nutrition label on it, and you wanna look at the label, will tell you exactly what you're getting in the food that you're gonna be picking out. So the first thing you always wanna look at is serving size and see how much that particular serving is going to give you. So in this product, one serving, which is two thirds of a cup is gonna give you about 230 calories. You look at it, for, if you're looking for protein, you look at the proteins, three grams. Well, when we pick up protein, we also want to look at what other ingredients are in the product. So, for example, this product has eight grams of fat, one gram of saturated fat. 
We really try to encourage people to limit their saturated fat. So if this product said that it had like 25 grams of saturated fat, which is a lot, it would be something you would not want to choose. The other thing I have people look at is sodium. A lot of these products can put a lot of sodium into them and you really don't want to have a product that's very high in salt. It's just not healthy for the body. So when I tell people to look at their sodium, usually we categorize anything 140 milligrams of sodium or less is a low sodium food. And anything over 300 is considered a higher level sodium food. So you want to look at that. The other big thing you want to look at um, is your sugars. So it will, will tell you how much sugar is in the product and it will tell you how much added sugars. So this particular product has 12 grams of sugar and 10 of those have been added sugar, meaning they've added sugar to that product. A lot of people will say, well, what does 10 grams mean? So just as a reference point, a teaspoon of sugar, it has about four grams. So when you look at this product and there's 10 grams of sugar in it, it has about two and a half, equivalent to about two and a half teaspoons of sugar. Um, why the added sugar is important is that some products have natural sugar in it. Milk naturally has sugar in it. So if you look at a milk product, it's going to have sugar in it. But if you look at the added sugar, that will tell you how much it's added. And just to um, talk about that a little too, some of the protein drinks that are higher in calories may have a little bit more sugar in them. But sometimes you have to balance if your body needs a little bit more sugar for the calories, but you're going to be getting the protein. So you have to look at the whole package. Um, I often talk to people about ways to add protein to their diet. As I've mentioned several times, a lot of people going through treatment, it's just very difficult for them to eat. So a lot of times we recommend that they have small, frequent meals, eat every couple of hours and eat small portions. So I try to go over with them different um ideas to get protein in their diet. For example, you could have a quarter of a cup of nuts, some string cheese with um, grapes, Greek yogurts, great hummus, crackers with peanut butter. Now that it's apple season, apples with peanut butter is great, cottage cheese, um, an English muffin pizza will give you protein. Um, people will buy the different cheeses like laughing cow, have it with crackers, your celery sticks mixed with peanut butter, tuna fish mixed with light mayo. As I mentioned before, um, the patient that, could, that couldn't believe how much protein was in a can of tuna. Peanut butter is always great to have as a snack. And you, a lot of people will make a shake and they'll add peanut butter to it. Um, this says eight ounces of skim milk. You don't necessarily have to add use skim milk. Um, yogurt and berries. Um, a piece of toast with peanut butter on it are all good sources. Um, drinking your nutrition is what I go over with a lot of people too, that they find that it's easier for them to drink. So um, you could make yourself smoothies. Those are very popular. And it's a lot of times it's a good way to get your fruits and vegetables into your diet if you're having a hard time to eat them. So this just um, shows you start with the base. And usually I recommend the bases have some type of protein, whether it be milk, soy milk, a protein drink. And then you can add different flavors um, to give it a little bit better taste. People will, sometimes it's hard to find coffee flavored protein drinks. Um, and the reason why is, and I asked a representative one time, is that New England is practically the only area that uses a lot of coffee flavor products. So a company that's nationwide usually doesn't have a coffee because they really don't have a big request for it. So a lot of times if you like that coffee flavor, you could add instant coffee. Um, you can add peanut butter, chocolate um, flavoring to it. Some people are trying to increase their protein even more. So if you have a um, base, so let's say an Ensure, and you're trying to get more protein into it, you could add some powdered milk. You could add any uh, protein powder. And a lot of people, to get more nutrients in, they'll add things like spinach, carrots, um, kale, different fruits, um, uh, chia seeds and chia seeds will also give you some protein and two tablespoons of chia seeds has about five grams of protein in them. So you can make a variety of drinks and sometimes people get bored if they're just drinking the same protein drink every day. 
but if they add different flavors into it, it can make it a little bit more interesting. Plant-based protein ideas, um, you can um, use lentils or chickpeas in your salad, garbanzo peas in your salad, um, lentil soups, split pea soups are great. Making a vegetarian chili, you get a lot of protein in it. Um, using black beans in your tacos and burrito, burritos, um, roasted chickpeas are very good. We talked before about the hummus adding canali beans to your favorite pasta dishes, adding chickpeas, um, your peanut butter or your, any of your nut butters on toast or crackers, and um, your hot cereal or your cold cereal, adding like nuts. We talked about the pumpkin seeds being popular. Um, that will give you extra protein too in a vegetarian way. So, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the American Institute for Cancer Research, which is a very good website um, that you can get a lot of good information on it. So the American Institute for Cancer Research focuses a lot about on research and foods and which the best foods are for your body. So I'm going to talk a little bit about survivorship guidelines. So what survivorship guidelines is um, foods that you want to use to, to promote more health in your diet. Um, the research suggests that the same evidence-based guidelines that they recommend to help prevent cancer can also help against its return. No single food can protect you against cancer by itself, but research has shown that if you eat a variety of fruits, especially fruits, especially what we talked about, your vegetables, your fruits, your whole grains, your beans, and your other plant foods can help lower your risk for many types of cancer. In laboratory studies, many individual minerals, vitamins, and phytochemicals demonstrate anti-cancer effects. So you find a lot of these products in your fruits, in your vegetables, in your plant foods. That's why there's so much emphasis now in trying to get a lot of plant foods into your diet. The foods that they recommend to limit um, that which your body doesn't like uh, it's not is alcohol, your processed meats like your sausage, your ham, your bacon, your hot dogs, your salami. Those may have some protein in them, but they're not the best source of protein because they're high in saturated fats. A lot of them have preservatives in them, and they've been shown to not have a good effect on the body when you eat them. Your red meat we talked about, um, they're higher in saturated fats, so we like to have, try to limit them. Um, what we're trying to do is when I talk to people about what their diet is after their treatment, is we try to we're trying to make the shift to a plant-based diet. And a lot of times I can see the look in their eye. A plant-based diet is not a vegetarian diet. What a plant-based diet is, is that you try to get a lot of plant-based foods because of all the healing powers they can have. So the typical American diet, when we think of protein, we think about, oh, I'm going to have a piece of steak tonight. What are we going to have with it? We're trying to have protein be more like a side dish, like, oh, I'm going to have a stir fry dish. You're going to have a lot of your fruits, um, excuse me, not fruits. You could put fruits in the stir fry, but you're going to have a lot of your vegetables in there that are going to give you all the phytochemicals. And you can use your chicken as a smaller amount of chicken in there as if you would sit down eating just chicken as your main source and then having a little side vegetable. So what we recommend is to slow start is to designate one day a week, we're going to choose plant-based protein instead of meat. So let's say you're going to have chili. Instead of making chili with a meat product, um, you can go online and get a lot of recipes that are made a vegetarian chili that's just made with your beans. And that will give you a lot of protein because as we saw, your beans have a lot of protein, but you're also going to get the fiber from your beans. You're going to get the vitamins, the minerals that you wouldn't get if you were just using, um, at, let's say, your beef in there. Um, you want to try to limit your red beef consumption, which is considered your beef, your lamb, and pork to no more than eight ounces a week. And this is when you start out, um, you know, you, uh, we try to have people, if they can cut back the red meat as much as possible, that could be very healthy. And especially if you have other conditions, let's say health, or you have heart conditions, 
um, they recommend that you avoid the red meat. And as I said before, the processed meats is something that we really want to tr um, try to avoid. And I know this isn't um, protein, but I just wanted to kind of go into the plant-based diet. Your vegetables, they try to have you eat at least three servings of vegetables on most days to start out with, but you want to eventually try to aim to have five servings of vegetables and a serving of vegetable is about half a cup. And in your vegetables, like you can get quite a bit of protein in your spinach, you can get quite a bit of protein in your peas, so you can always get the protein. Your fruits, um, recommending that you try to eat at le least one serving of fruit a day to start, but on most days, we're trying to aim for two or three. Your grains, like we talked about the quinoa that's very high in protein, um, they give your body a lot of fiber and a lot of nutrients. So you want to try to make your plate be mostly fruits and vegetables and your plant sources of protein. Now, the survivorship diet is a lot of other things that they recommend. I could do a whole talk on survivorship skills, uh, but I just wanted to point out, since we were talking about protein, on what the shift is for protein. So in conclusion, you want to provide your body with adequate protein. Um, you want to try to eat some protein with each of your meal and snack when you're going through treatment and you're trying to get extra protein and it's difficult. Make smart choices when you're selecting your source of protein. Like we talked about the red meat and the processed meats and foods high in saturated fats, you have to be careful. Try to include plant-based sources of protein. And I also try to uh, caution people because um, a lot of people are going more plant-based. So you see a lot more in the grocery store, but you have to look at them. You know, if it's a fried, um, product made with soy, if you look at that food label, make sure you look at the fat. You may have that product may have a lot of fat and a lot of sodium. So even though it's a plant-based protein, it might not be the best choice for you. Um, and as I said before, plant sources of protein provide you with additional vitamins, mineral fibers, and phytochemicals, which are natural substances in the plant that may help to prevent cancer. So I know I gave you a lot of information about protein today. And um, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Meg. This was a really great presentation. And I know that it was it's going to do really well and answer a lot of questions that people may have about proteins that are good and healthy to eat. Let's see if we have any questions. Does not look like we do at the moment. And while you're putting your questions in the chat, um, this video will be on our Blum YouTube playlist, which you can access at our Blum Digital Resource Center, um, as well as some more resources. And we have a lot of other videos with other nutritionists, just like Meg, um, who have worked with us over the past few years. So definitely check out the rest of the videos in, these, in this Hot Topics and Nutrition series. And you can visit our website at www.dana-farber.org slash resource center. All right. Looks like we're all set. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, it was a pleasure to present this presentation, and I hope I answered some of your questions on protein. Thank you. Thank you.